thanks and thanks for the kind invitation and thanks to Jay and David for all the effort and sweat of setting up this wonderful uh, conference on approximate quantum computing and unsurprisingly this is what this talk will be about when we look at steps towards quantum advantages of quantum simulators. Now obviously I'm very embarrassed about Robin citing me yesterday concerning talks, the titles of which start with torts. Well, um, <laughs> here it's really meant in the sense that while it may be a long way for experimentalists to actually achieve such quantum advantages in quantum simulators, it may be less, uh, more around the corner than one might actually um, think. So there's one question in the focus of this, um, which is also one that was much in the focus of yesterday's talks and will even more so be in the focus of today's talks, which is when and in what precise sense we can hope quantum devices doing approximate quantum computing to provide some kind of computational speed up over classical computers. So we are extending on the theme of uh, Mick yesterday and also about Robin and uh, Aram and, and, and also um, others. Now the heart of the matter obviously is that uh, this has become much less of an academic question simply because it has become more likely to come up with a positive answer to achieving such kind of a quantum advantage, not the least due to the fact that some protagonists have decided to actually build such um, devices. So there's been a lot of um, funding in the private and the public sector on actually building such quantum devices. And this picture here is, showing, is shown from the, the European ramification of this, creating lots of hype and also much interest, I would say mostly for good uh, reasons. Um, good, so at the right hand side of this diagram we see the fully fledged universal quantum computer and for those, since we know that they can solve some NP problems in polynomial time, the question of a speed up is, can be considered uh, settled here and also um, well, there has been enormous efforts of actually building such devices and we are here, I'm humbled by being in the, in the epicenter of one of these endeavors of realizing a 20 to 50 qubit superconducting quantum computer. I'm much excited of learning more about this um, later today and, 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 and tomorrow. Exciting as this is, it seems fair to say that, I mean, we have these devices, but or soon have these devices, but we, it's still quite a long way towards achieving a, a fully fledged, short class, fault tolerant uh, quantum computer. So what we do have at present, as of today, are quantum simulators. So that's in the focus of this talk. So systems that allow for high levels of control and precision, but not quite enough to achieve a universal quantum computer. But there's one thing they are large. So the asymptotic limit is, is in a way inbuilt. They're the, the dirty and the, the ugly brothers of um, quantum computers, if you, if you want. But then new questions pop up. Um, so these analog or analog quantum simulators, so citing this gentleman here, um, <laughs> I mean, they, they in a way simulate themselves, right? They're surely not BQP complete. So what is their precise computational power? Then error correction, let alone fault tolerance, is unavailable. So is this a bug or a feature? I mean, is this just drowned by noise or is there some hope to have some robustness of quantum simulators or at least some spatial or time window where one can hope to do something interesting along uh, the way. So at best, we can hope for a notion of approximate quantum computing at the, at the heart of the matter here, but the good news is that we do have these dudes in, in, in the lab. So let's assume that one good day, I go into the lab, well, that was a joke, somebody else goes into a lab, <laughs> um, and um, is convinced of doing something, a, a quantum simulation that is interesting. I mean, clearly quantum simulators should solve problems that are physically interesting, but also inaccessible to quantum computers, so what you see should relate in one way or the other to a problem that is computationally hard in a precise sense. So let's assume this gentleman, this woman, does something and performs a proud measurement at the end of the day and the answer is five. Is this correct? 
Well, how would we know? It's a hard problem. And these are not NP problems, so we cannot efficiently check the correctness of the, of the quantum simulation. So how do we know we have done the right thing? And we will see and that we will meditate on this throughout the talk that uh, the question of a superior computational performance on the one hand and the certification on the other are kind of intertwined in almost two different sides of the, of the same coin. Here it will come in in the flavor of achieving a reasonable and testable quantum advantage in a quantum simulation. So that's what at stake here in this talk. Good. Okay, so let's get going. Um, analog, analog e quantum simulators. Anyway, um, the most advanced architecture for that type of endeavor is code atoms in optical lattices. There's a lot to say about that. I will not for today. There would be a talk in its own right. Ask me about it if interested. For the present purposes, I think it's good enough to say that these are very large-scale lattice simulators. Um, and I'd like to tend to cite Ian Wormsley in this context, who gave a beautiful talk on some optical protocol, and then some guy asked in the audience, oh, but can you make this an asymptotic protocol? And then Ian Wormsley said, we are experimentalists. We are not asymptotic people. But well, this is not quite true here. This is kind of asymptotic in the sense that you have good control over 10 to the power of 4, even 5 sites and particles in such an optical lattice system. You can probe ground state problems like topological order in a ground state. You can do sudden quenches and look at the time evolution generated by a many-body local Hamiltonian for longer and longer times. You can look at slow evolutions reminiscent of adiabatic quantum computing and so on. If interested, ask me about it. So there's a lot to say about this, but I will only say one thing. A, a picture that I like to show in this context, I've shown this before, is in the context of the foundations of statistical mechanics and how equilibration and thermalization comes about. I think you will say more about this in your talk, um, where it's a complicated story. Again, ask me, but roughly speaking, you have control over a one-dimensional system of like about 100 sites of the order of magnitude. And you can prepare this in a 1010101010 charge density wave initial state. And then you can suddenly quickly quench the system to a fully interacting many body Hamiltonian and say monitor the number of odd particles, of particles in the odd sides as a function of time. And you see initially there are no odd particles whatsoever, and there's a complicated dynamics, and for long times it will eventually equilibrate. Now, that's great. And um, this is a many-body simulation, if you want. But this picture here should not only show us the quantum simulation in the lab, if you want, but also not a fit, but a classical re-simulation of the same problem on a classical supercomputer that's shown as the blue curve. And it seems fair to say that the agreement is, is very good. Now, for our purposes, that's not just some classical simulation, but it is done, it was done using the best algorithm for that type of problem at the time, based on matrix product states. It takes about, about five weeks of runtime per plot for a PhD student, and it was run on the Jülich Supercomputing Center, which is the fastest computer of Germany, which is a pretty large economy after all. So, um, so this is kind of the, the upper limit of a publishable numerical result, if you want, and the agreement seems good. The interesting feature is that for short times, you can do this if you want even to a rigorous one or error, if, if you have to. So you really know what's going on, except that at some point, you reach a barrier and you can no longer simulate because the entanglement growth is too much, and you can no longer faithfully represent the state at hand with the matrix product state. But that generates the interesting situation that the experiment runs on. Why would nature care what we can efficiently capture with, with our classical computer, and you can ask questions on the problem better on the quantum simulation where the classical simulation is only used in order to build trust in the correctness of the quantum simulation. It's kind of an interesting state of affairs. So um, to cut a long story short, short times can be efficiently simulated, long times not, and that's an interesting uh, tension if you, if you want. There is related settings of such a kind where, say, when you probe kibble zurich type mechanisms or many-body localization, I think we will hear more about this later. And again, if interested, ask me about it. Um, where 
you have the situation that in one D you can really hammer down this problem completely numerically and with all glory and error bars you can just simulate it fully out and see what's going on in the lab. Yet 2D is completely out of the way, but the step experimentally to go from 1D to 2D is a very small step and just requires some tuning of some confinement. So again, 1D systems can be done in order to check the correctness of the simulation, but then you can now go 2D and go into a realm that you can no longer um, keep track of. So this is sometimes underappreciated, but this is important to stress that um, already there are existing quantum simulators that in a way outperform state-of-the-art simulations on classical supercomputers in the sense that they outperform the, the best performance using the best algorithms um, to, to date. This is great. This is a nice baby step in, in, in the right direction. I'm, I'm convinced this is um, true. But then one can play devil's advocate. I mean, in fact, most physicists are already happy with that type of explanation, I, I would I, I like to add. But you can also play devil's advocate. Clearly, you can say, ah, there could be a better simulation method for the same type of problem. And how am I to say that this cannot be, be, be true? In fact, I'm often getting um, emails of people who have re-simulated this with another method. And that's extremely exciting. And it's a nice uh, challenge, so to say. <coughs> and um, that's very interesting. <coughs> one has to be careful, however, not to fall into one of two fallacies, which is one, it's not about reproducing just one plot but about reproducing a full functional dependence, meaning you have an, an, an array of, of, of knobs you can turn, and you want to faithfully approximate this whole array of plots um, in, 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 in an efficient fashion, which is a more demanding um, uh, constraint. And it's about predictive power. You just want to, don't want to generate a plot that you want to compare with other plots, but you want to make a plot and say, up to that accuracy, I know what's going on, at least in the classical simulation. That could be a fair viewpoint. But I'm not saying that there cannot be a classical algorithm that does that. It's a nice challenge, and one should do these things. There could be clever methods of doing the same thing classically as well, which is that, to be sure, we would like to prove a, the hardness of the problem and identify a feasible task that lies outside BPP but it's not BQP hard, so some intermediate problem that may not be so interesting or whatever, but it is some problem that, for good reasons, would be computationally hard on a classical computer. So we are in the realm of super polynomial computational speedups, kind of building on the themes of Mick, uh, Robin, uh, Aram, and, and others, uh, Ed and others um, yesterday. So the aim is to not solve the world's problem, it would also be good, but not for today. Um, but to just some, some find some problem, no matter how interesting, for which there's strong evidence for a computational super polynomial um, speed up. This endeavor is a kind of a milestone. This was formerly known as the concept of quantum super computational supremacy, the infamous S word, although this has fallen a bit in disfavor. I'm no longer often using it, but it's clear what it's meant. It's, it's like the quantum advantage, you want to do something for which you have good evidence that you're solving a problem that you cannot do um, otherwise. Now, one of the most cited problems along these lines is the famous boson sampling problem that goes back to work by um, Scott Aronson and Alex Akipov, um, which is a very simple prescription at least on, on, on paper, where you have n bosons, like photons, in m optical modes that are being sent through a linear optical multiport that is governed by a Haar random U that makes a mode transformation on these bosonic modes. And at the end of the day, you are measuring the particle number, say 10010. Let's do it again. 11000, whatever. It's, a, it's random. It's like a quantum Galton board. Now, it produces some distribution that looks actually pretty uniform. It's a, just some distribution, but at the heart of the matter is that the distribution is so intricate that you cannot quite do the same sampling on a classical machine. In fact, sampling from a distribution that's close to an additive error in the L1, L1 norm, in the total variation distance to the true boson sampling distribution is computationally hard. I mean, would lead to a collapse of the polynomial hierarchy to the third level with high probability if the unitary U 
is chosen from the Haar measure, and m, the number of modes, increases sufficiently fast with n, the number of, um, of photons in, in, in the system. And that was an excitement to many linear optics people who, at least proof of principle wise, ran into the lab and, and generated this because it's an exciting setting to think of a quantum advantage in a, an architecture that doesn't require a full tolerant big style quantum computer, but just a simple sampling prescription along these, along these lines. Now, how can we be sure that we've done the right thing? Say, so can we check that the state prepared at the end is the right state we, we think we have? And this can be nicely formulated in terms of a membership problem or weak membership problem or some variant thereof is a bit like direct fidelity estimation where you would do measurements and you can almost do it in the sense that for a fixed photon number, an arbitrary number of modes, you can, with physically realistic measurements, can certify that you are like close in, in fidelity or one norm to the right state. But for a fixed photon number, it's not, that's not quite enough because for the boson sampling, you need to scale up the boson number to have an interesting problem. So good, but not good enough. Actually, what is even more interesting is that if you just look at the, at the black box verification setting, what is true is that if you have a quantum circuit, there is always a slightly longer classical circuit th that is efficiently operating that cannot be distinguished from the quantum distribution from polynomial samples alone. So this doesn't take anything away from boson sampling. I mean, it's an extremely interesting setting, but it generates a kind of ironic twist to the story in that you have a quantum device that's doing a super performance, but there's a slightly more complicated classical prescription that operationally looks the same as the quantum prescription. You have a quantum super machine, and it's not operational distinguishable from a classically efficiently working machine. That's an interesting kind of twist to the, to the, to the story. It shows how important it is to, to think of verification schemes. And well, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, uh, there's no need to be very much surprised about it. That's a sloppy way of putting it. You say, well, sure, but that's not too surprising because in order to be able to verify quantum simulation, one needs to be able to efficiently simulate it. If you can, that's great. Um, if you cannot, then you cannot, and you can make measurements to build trust in the correctness of the simulation or so, but, uh, but ultimately there's no efficient verification scheme that ultimately um, settles this. This is a commonly stated um, as setting. Now, along these lines, and I think Mick also gave a nice overview about these ideas um, yesterday, uh, there has been a lot of effort in kind of elaborating on schemes that address such intermediate problems, like beyond boson sampling. I mean, we heard about IQP circuits, then variants in terms of random universal circuits. There's these famous Google endeavors of uh, realizing quantum advantages in these superconducting qubit machines, as we nicely heard um, also yesterday. There is schemes based on easing type interactions, which are extremely interesting. They are closest to what I will say in the, in the, in the rest of the talk. However, to be fair, um, this involves a setting that is periodic, but the unit cell has 56 qubits as, as one unit cell before the system again um, repeats itself. This is extremely interesting and, and very nice and, and paradigmatic, but it's not very, I mean, it's not practical to think of a of a machine that has a period of 56 qubits to start with. But paradigmatically is, of course, um, very exciting. So the good news about this is that um, these settings have, um, they're probably classical hard with additive um, L1 arrows under reasonable assumptions, and we'll come to that um, later in this talk. At the same time, it seems fair to say, at least if we are thinking of this large-scale kind of quantum simulation type settings that we have in mind here, it's, they are very hard to scale up with present technology. That's surely the case for like boson sampling where, where like mode matching or so will most likely eat you up if you go to larger systems. I think it seems fair to say then some schemes require arbitrary gate choices, which is good, 
but it can be, well, depending on the architecture, real, realistic or extremely demanding, say, I mean, it's also very close to a universal quantum computer, after all. If you have that, then you can also build a, a quantum computer. Um, in the type of setting we have in mind here, it seems out, totally out of the way to think of a, a fully gate-based local quantum circuit that you built up. So it's not, not very realistic. And then periodic Hamiltonians is good. You think of optical lattice systems. They are standing wave um, uh, sending waves made from counter-propagating laser light, but then if you think of periodic 56 in the lattice, then experimentalists will frown at you and say, okay. Um, I mean, it's, it's paradigmatic. It's very interesting, but it's not a, a, a thing you can actually realize in any realistic lab in, 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 our, um, in our lifetime. But it, it's um, very interesting, of course. Now, what I will say in the rest of this talk is to what extent it's possible to think of feasible quantum simulators showing a speed up that combine the benefits of both worlds and bring the speed ups closer to experiment precisely having that type of many body architecture in, in mind that I, we alluded at, at the beginning of, of, of the talk. So Mick has had this nice picture of this space time trade off. So we here allow for slightly more space, but to go back in time in an extreme fashion as we will um, elaborate on uh, in a, a, a second from now. So what is the, we had this desiderata list um, in, in Shelby's talk yesterday. Um, that was very nice. She'll be also writing a paper with her that also has these boxes ticked. So um, the desiderata that we want to achieve here is we want to have a kind of a, a Hamiltonian Granger architecture that's very similar to what we've seen in these actual quantum simulations that actually probe physically interesting many body problems. That's a reasonable type of architecture in this setting. Then we don't want um, a, well, we want a periodic setting, but not like periods of 56 or something, or large, but we want to have Hamiltonians, which are also not long range, but like nearest neighbor, or at best, next nearest neighbor. I mean, that's stuff that you can reasonably hope for to implement in a, in a, in a, in a realistic setting of that type. And you want to have hardness proof with L1 norm errors under uh, some reasonable assumptions. That's the list of desiderata that you want, and that's what we elaborate on in, 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 the, in the rest of this, of this talk. And the point I'm making, and that's also the, the last and the key point of this talk, um, is that, yes, you can do this. this yes, we can. <laughs> so last year. Or, um, but there are schemes of such a type that would live up to these expectations. And we have a couple of them. But for reasons of time and for the next speaker and the coffee break, I will only hint at one, but I'm very happy to discuss more in any uh, break you, you wish. So some are periodic, some are, have a bit of randomness, some are completely translation invariant. There's different flavors, but all are, are kind of simple, if you want. So let's look at this. What is it? OK, you have a square lattice, OK, d by d lattice. And you prepare the state initially in a product state, the system in a product state. So this is, um, it has some randomness, but just whether it's zero or like a bit of a tilted state. It's a product state, a simple initial thing. Um, there's also a scheme without randomness, but this one has a bit of randomness, fine. To emphasize that, this is reminiscent of like ground states of disordered optical lattices. That's something that produces a lot of interest in the condensed matter and called atoms community. This has been done recently, like in Manuel Bloch's lab, to have such a ground state of a disordered model. And I think Bela will continue along these lines in his talk um, later on many body localization and so on. So that's something that's not completely out of the way, but that's something that can be reasonably done in, in, in labs as of today. The next step is a Unit time evolution under Hamiltonian, but not a 56 periodic Hamiltonian or whatnot, but a plain vanilla nearest neighbor easing Hamiltonian, as you know it from high school. Um, so it's nearest neighbor easing Hamiltonian evolved for one unit in time accounted for in the coupling strength of this Hamiltonian. Now, this is something that is not only feasible in optical lattice, but in fact has been done a long time ago. It was one of the first experiments in optical lattices using hyperfine levels called controlled collisions. That's basically implementing an easing Hamiltonian in, 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 in an optical lattice system. Even interestingly, this, was, this idea was predating the idea of a cluster state, 
and measurement-based computing. In fact, that was born out of that. That was this guy first, and people thought, oh, that's an interesting state. Can you do something with it? And then the cluster state and measurement-based computing was emerging out of that endeavor. So my point is, that's not only realistic, but that's something that has been done long ago in the lab. Such a quench for unit time. And the last bit, you just measure the thing. Just measure it out. You measure all qubits in the X space. You do a sampling measurement in the X spaces. Now, this is also not unrealistic in such an architecture. There is single site addressing. That's, again, creating much interest in, in this community. I think it seems fair to say that this is the most challenging step because you really need single site resolution. It has to be a good measurement and so on. This is possible within limits. So if there's some hesitation, it is here that this may not be completely around the corner. But to be fair, you can do single site addressing measurements in realistic large-scale optical lattice experiments. So this is the setting. Product state, one unit of time, like a unit depth circuit, and you measure the thing. And this is the scheme. Now I'm lacking imagination, but I find it difficult to think of a simpler scheme of having a state prepared, one unit of time, and measuring the state out. So this is what it is. And the statement is that, um, that this is producing a, a scheme that shows a quantum advantage in the same sense as like IKP circuits and boson sampling and so on. So assuming three highly plausible complexity theoretic assumptions, conjectures, a classical computer cannot efficiently sample from the output distribution of our scheme up to a constant error in the L1 distance unless one accepts a collapse of the polynomial M hierarchy. So that's a kind of similar statement, but again, it's unit depth circuit, it's kind of realistic an experiment, and there's a, a feature of this that I will highlight at the very end of the talk, which is a nice feature to have in, in, in such a setting. Now, um, to have some time for meditation at the end, it's 26 minutes into the talk, I, I will say a bit only of the type of argument, but there's also the coffee break coming up. So, I mean, the logic of the argument is not maybe so surprising to the experts, a long and winding story in detail because you have to go through things, but the overall logic is, is not so, um, so hard to capture. So, Ultimately, this whole tricky hardness of approximation of the outcome distribution in worst case comes from it being sharply hard to approximate the output distribution from an all x measurement on the circuit up to a constant um, relative error at the end of the, of the day. And the overall argument is that the physical scheme you implement makes no use of any gates or adaption or post-processing or whatever. You just quench and make a sampling measurement, but this type of setting can be related to a measurement-based scheme on a cluster state with measurements in the xy plane, non-adaptively, which in turn can be related to a random circuit that involves T gates, set gates, control sets, and, and Hadamard gates, which is a post-selected universal quantum, random quantum, um, quantum circuit. And that alone is good enough to up to multiplicative, multiplicative errors in the total variation distance show that if you could sample from that, you would get a collapse of the polynomial um, hierarchy. Yet this, is, this would be very demanding to have such a small multiplicative error. So this can be beefed up to a more sensible additive error in the total variation distance by making use of this logic of Stockmeyer's argument that takes as input a classical algorithm that samples from the output distribution of a unitary U prime that is close up to additive error to the true um, circuit that you would want to have realized, and a binary string that takes the role of the actual output of the, of the sampling thing that you get out at the end of the day. And what it produces is the, um, is the um, approximate probability of getting precisely that outcome for this approximate circuit up to a multiplicative error. Now, this can be used, I mean, this is the approximate probability for the approximate circuit, but this can be related to the true probability of the true circuit by making use of the, of the Markov inequality and using a property of this distribution that's called um, anti-concentration property of, of this. And if you combine this in, in, a, in, a, in a good fashion, you see that you get a hardness argument for an additive error in the L1 distance for the full M sampling setting. So ultimately, if you could sample from the type of distribution, you would get, again, a collapse of the polynomial hierarchy. So what are the 
conjectures going into the game here. So the first conjecture is that the polynomial hierarchy is infinite. That's an assumption, clearly. But there's a plausible assumption from complexity theoretic uh, perspectives. Like at the lowest order, this would be that you assume that P is not NP. That's also an assumption, but well, that's what you, what you assume. What you also assume here is that it's an average case complexity assumption that for a constant fraction of the instances, it's as hard to sample from the outcomes of measurement as it is in the, in, in the, in the worst case. So that's an average case hardness assumption that's not, unco this, not uncommon in these schemes, but basically, I mean, strictly speaking, this is um, an assumption. And finally, there is the anti-concentration property of the output distribution. There's much less known about anti-concentration than about like, large deviation bounds or concentration. But this is what it is, so that's a property of the distribution that here is not proven in, for this specific example, but there's overwhelming obvious evidence that this is the case because the distribution is Thomas Porter distributed to overwhelming numerical evidence, and that would hence anti-concentrate. What we do have is that it's rigorous proofs for random circuits making use of um, epsilon approximate uh, unitary designs, where we can show that this, is, this anti-concentration is true for nearest neighbor random circuits, which would produce examples of schemes of that type, but not precisely the scheme I've just mentioned. I'm just saying we work on getting rigorous uh, statements on anti-concentration bounds in several flavors, and also make us work on that. But in this specific setting I just mentioned, there's a numerical evidence for this, which is yet overwhelming in a, in a certain sense. So to cut a long story short, this is a setting that is in that type of uh, system. It's highly plausible. It's a, it's a unit depth circuit. You can kind of realize it in the lab, but the quantum simulation, like this sampling experiment, is intractable for classical computers. So you have a quantum advantage setting that, in this sense, it's highly simplified and, and uh, made more, more, more plausible. That's great, but there's one more property that I would like to stress to come to the end of my talk. 31 minutes, I want to be nice in time which is one desirable feature that this scheme has that I'm not aware of this feature being present in any other known scheme, which is still a, a good thing to have, which is the following one. You can do this experiment, but you can also go into the lab and perform measurements that are quite similar to the actual measurements that you do for the sampling, such that with the order of n many measurements, you get an outcome of, of, the, of these guys, and from them, you can detect not only like some trust value. You cannot just say, oh, the measurement gives me trust that the simulation has been right, or you, you get a convincing argument that things are going well. But the measurements you get directly bound the L1 norm distance to the actual samples that you use in the hardness proofs. So you make measurements. It's not error correcting, because it's without error correction. But you make measurements. And then if you're lucky enough, the green light goes on. And you says, oh, that's great. It's correct. And I can use this, these outcomes to my sampling experiment. And I've, I've done it. Of course, you can be unlucky. And then you make measurements, and the light is red. Too bad. Then there's too much noise in the system. There's nothing you can do about it. But it's a, it's a verifiable setting in the sense that the green light goes on. It's not just building trust or being happy about things. It's really verifying the very same property that goes into the hardness proof, which is a nice feature because it, it, it verifies the, 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 the setting. And this is a, a, a very nice feature to have because it, it shows this, it kind of resolves this ironic twist I was um, mentioning earlier. So there's this somewhat sloppily formulated common prejudice that in order to be able to verify a quantum simulation, one needs to be able to efficiently simulate it. And well, this is not quite true in the sense that one can think of trustworthy quantum simulators in the sense that they do something not terribly interesting. I mean, this is like an advantage type experiment, but they do something that you cannot keep track of on a classical computer, but you can efficiently check whether they've done the right thing from a few measurements. And from that, you can infer that your measurement has been right if the noise levels are small enough. So that's interesting, because you can check whether it's correct, but you cannot predict the outcome of the measurement. For that, you need to go into the lab. You need to sum. You need to do it, but you can efficiently check whether the outcome has been right. And this is a nice feature, and it's possible that you can, can do something quantum. You can have an advantage and still efficiently certify that you have done the right thing. Good. 
I think that's a perfect moment to summarize and, and come to the meditation part, yeah? Oh, yeah, it's good. I'm going good with time. So what we have looked at. So we've um, meditated in this talk on the question whether there is any hope for feasible quantum simulators with a super polynomial speed up that is kind of reminding or reminiscent, as Earl taught me, <laughs> um, that, that are reminiscent of these of what physics people in, in called atom settings also would call a quantum simulator, whether with these type of systems, of realistic systems that actually exist with present or past technology, whether they are good enough to show super polynomial speedups in the sense as we're discussing here at the conference. And the answer is, well, yes, to, in, in, in a good sense. So these are not fault tolerant, but this is not a feature, not a bug, it's a feature. I mean, you don't want to be fault tolerant because that's not, not plausible in that type of architecture to be fully fault tolerant, but it is kind of error detecting in a certain way. I mean, you can make a measurement, you can build trust, and if the green light goes on, you are, you're very honest. You will never publish a dishonest result in the sense that maybe you publish a, a red light and say, oh, I haven't been there, that's as good as it gets, but that's my outcome, here's my result. It is what it is. Or you have a green light, but then you can really show what you've done, and, and it's a certified um, quantum advantage experiment, which is a nice uh, feature to have. So one can efficiently assess the correctness of a supremacy or oh, advantage type experiment of this in this sense, even if the simulators exhibit quantum computational speedups. This is this is great. So. Um, open questions. Well, there's loads. I mean, it's nice. I mean, but it's still very paradigmatic. So from a physics perspective, when you talk to the Immanuel blocks of the world, they want to say, oh, that's great. But they want to see this more, even more closer to the actual experiments on disordered Hamiltonians. I mean, ironically, it's a, it's a, it's a baby step in this direction in the sense that you can also take the, the randomness and put it to the Hamiltonian, you can read this as a quench from a ground state of a local phase, local gap phase, to a disordered model and looking at the time evolution, but it's a bit artificial. You want to bring it closer to something people are really physically interested in labs and say, oh, that's physically interesting, but still you have something, some computation advantage. That links to one of the questions that Robin was flashing in his thing. More computer science speaking, you want to be closer to structured problems, to, to special purpose type problems, annealing problems, optimization problems that are interesting and bring it more into that realm of not just having some speed up, but having a speed up and, and kind of at least solve some semi-interesting or even interesting problem at the end of the day. Then what's the robustness of quantum simulators? Are they doomed to failure in the long run? Well, not so clear. Uh, is there error correction? No, but is there some sort of step in that direction? Yes, ask me about it if interested. I mean, you can at least do some sort of basic approximate error correction in a way. It's not, an, not error correction because there's no code. It's a state preparation. But you can do something to, to bring you closer in, in the total variation distance to what you want. So what is the scope of approximate error correction in this context that links to themes that David has also put up on the web page for this workshop. I think there's an important question to, to, to ask. And then space-time trade-off. That's a beautiful picture that Mick showed in his talk. It's quite, <laughs> quite exciting. They have the timeline and the number of qubits. It's beautiful to have. The, the main message here in this talk maybe is that it's great to think of large systems, but size is not all. I mean, it's not about numbers alone, but it's also of the type of control you have. And, the flexibility you have in, in time and space uh, settings. And here, the cute thing is that you can, by having a bit of more spatial overhead, you can bring down the time overhead to, to a unit time circuit, a unit depth circuit, and you can still think of these quantum advantage settings. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the questions you might have. We're going to take questions. I mean, you seem to be saying that you can do a supremacy experiment in which you can verify 
even when you're in the realm where you cannot do a simulation. Now, you, you asserted that, but you didn't tell us how you do it. How ah. do you verify when you cannot produce the, uh, how can you verify the correctness in a situation when you claim you cannot sample? Ah. I mean, Let's, that was the key point of your talk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It would be nice That's to know the answer. Yeah. Very good. Thanks for the question. Um, so um, so the, the, the point here is what you can do is you can make a measurement and from that verify the trace norm closeness to the prepared state to the actual state you would want to have prepared. And from that, you can infer that if you do a sampling measurement, that this distribution that you get is also up to that epsilon close in the total variation distance. It's not a black box verification. So I, I think for that, the same arguments that I hinted at earlier would also hold. I mean, just looking at, at, at samples would not do the job. But what you can do is you make measurements, and um, then you can infer that you are one on close to the right state. And then you say, well, how do you do it? And it's extremely simple. It's, I mean, it's embarrassingly simple. And the point here is not that you can do it. But the interesting aspect is that you can produce a scheme and, and, and shape that so that very simple measurement scheme is possible. And I'll tell you what it is. You can see the state that you have basically as a ground state of a frustration-free Hamiltonian, and then you just measure terms, right? You measure Hamiltonian terms, and then if you get, it's like a bit like a stabilizer state. And you, make, you make measurements, and if you get the right outcome sufficiently many times, you can infer that you're close in, the, in one norm distance, right? Because you're frustration-free, then you make measurements, and then if the outcome is right, you can infer that you're close to the right state, right? So, but this is not very difficult or elaborate or deep in any way. What is kind of neat about this is that you can tailor a scheme so that the ultimate state you have, you have prepared can be seen as a ground state of a frustration-free Hamilton, and then you can make these pretty stupid measurements. Yeah? But thank you for the question. Hi, um, could you go back to the plot on the Trotsky paper? I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, know what I'm <laughs> you want to talk about this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very good. We can also One do of the now. people that's in your hand. <laughs> <now. laughs> uh, you oh. it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we will start your question and I will, in the meantime, I can listen. I'm a man, I'm not good at multitasking, but this is something. Okay. There, yeah. So here, uh, the x axis, that's basically the swapping time. Exactly. Right? And you're measuring a local observable. Yeah. Well, right. it's, it's globally local. I mean, it's like it's, it's uh, the number of, of, of odd particles in the full many body system, but it's like morally, it's a local quantity. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I can just measure the number yeah, yeah, of particles yeah. in system. You J could measure one. Yeah. And do it again with, you know, yeah. J prime. So, because you're only evolving for, you know, like two swaps before it equilibrates. Yeah and you're measuring a local observable, what yeah. I can do is I can just simulate that side, and it's a 1D system, so I can just simulate that side in some small neighborhood, right? Yeah, sure. And that has to be enough. There is, you know, oh, no, no, they, of course. No, no, that, they, so there's no approximation there. I mean, oh, no, this is true. I mean, okay, this is an interesting question. I mean, what he, maybe to translate that a little bit, so what he says is like, I mean, forget about this even odd thing, just you measure one side. It's a local quantity, and then you make a, a, a dynamics under local Hamiltonian. We know that there is a, a sound or light cone type dynamics. It's like a Lee Robinson cone, which means that information will propagate up to exponentially small tails, up, up to a velocity, a sound velocity that is bounded by, by the graph and the operator norm of the Hamiltonian. But this can be checked in this, well, not in this Hamiltonian, it's Bose Hubbard, but morally it can. So that means that in order to predict this thing, it's perfectly right that you can look at a finite system that is linearly growing in time. Of course, the Hilbert space will grow exponentially, but never mind. For a finite time to approximate this. So in this sense, in, in time, it's exponentially heavy. In space, it's legally speaking efficient, although the prefactor will grow unfavorably in time. But it's true that one can, in principle, propagate this for a finite time and then truncate it at a finite level and make that type of prediction, right? The argument here is that you could do it. The algorithms that I mentioned have the same type of moral flavor in that they are exponentially costly in time and, and as I'm totally good in space, so to say, but they're still more favorable than this method. So it would still be better than this. Although 
strictly speaking, at the end of the day, if you have, this is still a constant time. So at some point, it's about prefactors. We could have a, a supercomputer that will just be good enough to do this on some finite system that's not yet available, but if you push it, at some point this will happen. So you have absolutely right, this could be done, except it's not, not possible at, at the moment, but that's what I said. That's why you want to work so harder and think of, I mean, of I, complexity. I actually, but there's one more thing I would like to say, which is, I mean, uh, one should be aware that if you have a product initial state and evolve that state under a local Hamiltonian, that this is in principle B could be complete. But even with the translation variant Hamiltonian, I was citing this just in the coffee break earlier, this, this thing. So in principle, it's a quantum computer to just do such a quench experiment. Of course, that's a kind of very elaborate Hamiltonian and very funny and complicated, but I'm just saying that there is kind of lots of space for this to be really hard in a, in a, in a quantifiable sense. But it's still true that ultimately, at some point, you take a, a big system, crunch it through, and you could do it. I mean, I actually did it, and I only needed like 12 sites, and I can evolve for as long as I want, and I get those curves. Yeah, we, we, we were discussing this by email. You know, in, yeah, yeah, then it's also about errors and predicts power, but this is what we want to discuss. Yeah, indeed. I mean, okay. it's, a, it's a nice challenge. I mean, you're not the only one presenting figures. I mean, there's also, you can do like um, dynamical mean field. It, it yeah. comes kind of close. It's missing some aspects. It's a nice challenge. And, and as I said, I mean, it's a baby step. It's good, and the trend is good to have. Ultimately, you will not be able to make a hard claim with that type of setting. That's why I had this disclaimer. Um, this one, that there could be devil's advocate. There could be clever simulation methods. I mean, that, let's talk about clever simulation methods. But it's still good to have this challenge. OK, so due to time constraint, we're going to move on to the next talk. Okay, let's thank our speaker again.